So we have another speaker in line for you. She is a front-end developer at gov.uk, which is the only access point for the UK government's digital services. And she also doesn't have a sense of smell. Alice Bartlett. <laughs> Ricky Martin, she bangs. Um, we'll get back to Ricky Martin in a minute. Um, but I did, uh, I chose that because uh, it was number one in Sweden um, 15 years ago ish. And I thought you guys would really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> uh, because, you know, you bought it, obviously. So, um, uh, oh, just wait, just wait. That was good. That Swedish simulator was like, I'm, I'm going to try that out. Um, okay, yeah, so um, uh, I'm Alice Bartlett. Uh, I'm a senior developer at the Government Digital Service. Um, hi to everyone who's watching this on um, the live stream. This is really modern and, and hip, isn't it? Um, so uh, just a heads up for people on the live stream, there are some um, user research videos in this that won't be live streamed, but I'll um, let you know when that's going to happen so that the stream cuts out and it's, you're not like there just refreshing your browser, but also... Um, uh, I'll summarize the videos at the end, so you won't, you won't have missed anything, hopefully. Well, you'll miss the video, but... Um, okay, so, uh, in this talk, a uh, little bit about who and what GDS is and, and what we're doing. Um, then I'll show you some user research about HTML select tags. Um, this user research is of real users not being able to use select boxes, um, and watching it, when I saw it for the first time, I felt kind of sick, actually, because, um, you know, I've been making websites with drop down menus and stuff and and it just really um it was just really horrid to think that i'd i'd made stuff that people couldn't use without even realizing it uh, and it made me wonder about the other stuff that i was doing that um that that i was building that people couldn't use because i was sort of too blinded by my own capability at using the internet i don't want to brag but um so so yeah this kind of this kind of opened up blew up a whole load of assumptions i had about users um for me, and so I wanted to come and share it with you because it's kind of, I just thought it was really powerful. Um, then I'll talk about some alternatives to select tags, uh, and then I'll talk about building your own custom alternative to a select tag. Um, and yeah, so let's, let's go. Uh, who are GDS? Uh, so I'm from the Government Digital Service, which is in the UK. Um, we're responsible for the digital transformation of government in the UK. Um, uh, the first thing we built was uh, gov.uk, um, which is the best place to find government services and information. So before gov.uk, there were like 300 different websites for every bit of government. Um, and now we've taken all of that, and they're all doing the same thing, like publishing stuff, and um, you know they had some forms and things. Uh, and now we've taken all of their publishing, we put it all into one place, um, and, it, and it's, this, it's this website. Um, and we've got a lot of stuff on GovUK because we've taken so much. Um, and so things like, when is the next UK bank holiday? That slide is incorrect, um, actually. Uh, uh, what is the current Foreign Office advice for traveling to Egypt? Um, and then we've got some like weirder stuff, like um, what is the tax import ruling for a human-shaped skull-like plastic object that contains LEDs embedded in the eye sockets? Um, <laughs> which is um, classified under CN code 39264000 as other ornamental articles of plastics. <laughs> um, so we've got 19 million visitors a week, uh, 330 departments and organizations call gov.uk their home, um, and we saved the taxpayer 1.7 billion pounds in the last uh, financial year, which is a lot of money. Um, yeah, thanks. Who whistled? Thank you. Uh, so, um, and we're not just fixing websites. Um, we are also we also design and build and run digital services, uh, which usually means redesigning them from the ground up. So, an example of a of a digital service is is this this is, this is carers allowance. Um, so, the user need for carers allowance is uh, when someone I know has a long term health problem or disability, I need financial support so I can care for them. Um, and you qualify for carer's allowance if you spend at least 35 hours a week caring for someone and you earn uh, less than 102 pounds per week. So like, that's not very much money at all. Um, 
Um, and yeah, so now you can go online and, um, and you can register for Carers Allowance, which is great. Uh, Carers Allowance has had 248,000 claims last year and a 90% user satisfaction, which is really high for a digital service, um, particularly of this nature. Um, and how we're doing this is we go, we build all of these services in roughly the same way, which is we um, work in the open. So all of our code is on GitHub, um, which you're all like, yeah, GitHub, obviously. But that's revolutionary for government. They're like, whoa, we can't put our code in the open. And we're like, yeah, you can. Um, uh, we do it in agile teams. Again, you're like, yeah, agile, obviously. Um, but that's really, you know, we brought that into government and they were like, what? <laughs> anyway, um, and we have multidisciplinary teams as well. So uh, you have a product and each team has designers, developers, and user researchers. Um, and we do a lot of user research at GDS because it helps us prioritize um, features uh, and it also stops us from implementing things that we think users need, but it turns out they actually don't. Um, and everybody in the team is encouraged to go to user research um, at least a couple of hours a month. Um, just to even like even the developers, even the back end devs who are you know not not touching anything user facing really. It's really important everybody goes to just build that kind of empathy with the users about what we're doing. Um, and user research highlights gaps in the way people interact with our services usually. So normally we get very kind of niche insights into things that we can improve about copy or, or general structure. Um, but then every so often we find out things about the web that we didn't know uh, or about how users use the web. Um, and those are the things that I'm like, oh, we could share this with people. They, this is interesting. Um, the other thing to say about our users is that they are on GovUK because they have to be. <laughs> oh, I'm missing a word there, but have to be. Um, and uh, mostly, they, uh, you know, best case, they've come to GovUK to do something that's just really boring. Um, like, you know, you, you, you understand it's like, uh, you have to pay taxes, that's boring. You have to claim benefits, that's boring. You have to apply for a fishing license, that's boring. You have to look up the tax code for a plastic skull that you want to import to the UK, also boring. Um, but that's actually the best case for us because the worst case is that you've come to GovUK because something has, something has happened to you that is bad. And, and so actually, you're not experiencing boredom when you're using GovUK, you're experiencing anxiety and uh, discomfort. And so, you know, we hope people are bored when they use Gov.uk because the alternative likely options are way worse. Um, but they are a reality when you're building government services. Um, and so we do user research to make sure that these interactions that users have with GovUK are really easy and they're not, um, you know, things get done and it's, it's not more stressful than it needs to be. Uh, and so users can come to our site, do their thing, and then leave. Um, and sometimes our user research shows us that we are letting our users down. Um, so on to section two, user research. Uh, so we're going to talk today about how people are using this select thingy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm going to show you this user research. Um, live stream audience. I'm going to talk for a bit, and then the, the live stream is going to cut out. Uh, and this next video is um, about a minute long, so you can go put the kettle on, then there'll be some more talking, then there'll be a three minute video in which you can make the cup of tea, and then you can come back, and it's all good. And everybody in the audience is like, oh, I wish I had a cup of tea, but tough shit, guys, you have to watch the videos. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so to talk about the participant, um, she is 30. She works in an office. Um, she's smart and nice. She has, um, she's just not so great with computers. And uh, you probably have lots of users who are like her. Um, there's a man in the video as well. Uh, he is her boyfriend. And the way we get users of low technical confidence to use um, our services for research is we say, bring the person that um, helps you with digital tasks at home along with you, um, and then you two can work together and that, that'll be fine. Um, I have permission to use this video, but please don't share it further. And again, please be respectful of these people in these videos because you know, they're doing something, they're essentially failing to use a select box, but it's, you know, there's a, there's a reaction to these videos, which is nervous laughter, which I understand, but like, if you could try not to do that, that'd be really great. So, live stream people, to your kettles.
have um, you have you have a focus state, um, which is not the same as a selected state. But she was confusing the 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 option that she wanted having focus with it being selected. So she was getting it to the focus using the arrow keys, and you can hear her like just you know jabbing the um, keyboard. Um, but then she actually never properly selected it, and she needed to either press enter or actually click on the number. And then her partner is like, just click on, just click on it, just click on it. And she's like, I am clicking on it, but they're talking about different its in this case, and so it's kind of confusing. Um, and all she wants to do is tell us her date of birth. Um, and we've thrown up this bit of UI that she can't work with. Um, OK, so participant number two uh, is using carer's allowance, which I mentioned earlier. Um, 35 hours a week and then for caring, and then you get to, and you need to be earning less than 102 pounds a week. Um, and Carers Allowance is a really good example of like a really difficult service for us to build. Um, not because it's technically difficult at all, but because the users of it tend to have low technical confidence. Not all of them for sure, but um, but certainly if you look at the factors that that you that contribute to low technical confidence or the likelihood that you're unconfident with computers, um, they are also the factors that mean you probably, you might qualify for carer's allowance. So, so poverty, age, and stress, basically. Um, so uh, you, if, you care for, if you qualify for carer's allowance, you're probably quite poor because you're earning less than £102 a month. Um, you're probably, there's a reasonable likelihood that you're quite old because you're looking after someone and their health may have deteriorated because they're old and you're their partner and so you're old. Um, and then stress is, is the final one, um, which is, you know, so if you're more stressed, your cognitive capacity is lower and you find doing things harder. Um, and then you look at the situation someone's in when they qualify for carer's allowance, which is that they spend 35 hours a week at least looking after someone. Um, and so they therefore are, you know, often quite tired. Um, and we see a small but meaning, meaningful number of transactions for carer's allowance between 1 and 2 a.m. Um, and we were like, this is interesting, an interesting pattern. I wonder if we're like, it's sort of odd, are we being hacked, what's going on? Um, and so we went and spoke to some users and we said, you know, why are you using the site at, at 1 a.m.? And they said, um, that's the only time I get any respite. I can't afford to spend time, half a day, to go down to the office to get this carer's allowance sorted. And so they wait until they're done with their caring for the day and then they go and claim carer's allowance. Um, and this is really great in one sense because it means that... Um, these people otherwise would have to spend like half a day going to a center, filling in loads of paperwork and stuff, and they're able to do it at their convenience. But at the same time, it really shows you the situation someone is in when they qualify for carer's allowance, um, and it makes it very difficult. Like, it makes them more complicated to support. Um, so this user is um, he's in his 70s. He qualifies for carer's allowance because he looks after his partner, and um, he, again, is trying to tell us his date of birth, um, but is being... Um, he can't because of the select boxes. So, uh, live stream people, four more minutes. Leave a call.
at the end there that he was perfectly capable of telling us what his date of birth was. He didn't, you know, he didn't have any problem with that. Um, it was just that he was unable to use the select boxes because we'd thrown up uh, a UI that he couldn't couldn't use. And um, and yeah, so so when that researcher asks him, you know, and people we see this a lot. People are actually fine. People who you know, can do loads of stuff on the web, like they can use YouTube, they can, they like watching videos, they're comfortable with iPlayer or listening to streaming services, but then you suddenly, you, you need a form and you think that'll be fine, and then, and then it's suddenly, it's like they just can't, you know, select boxes in particular seem really hard for them to use. Um, but we have, you know, we have alternatives, like we could have just given him uh, a text input, and in, indeed that's what we did, uh, and what we do now when we're asking for a date of birth. And I think people are okay with text inputs because they very much resemble what happens in paper forms and they're fine with that. So, um, so I've got loads of videos like this. Um, we see users unable to close the select menu, um, people typing into it, which is what that last guy did. He was, he, it was almost like he didn't see the list of options, let alone think that he could interact with it. So he was just trying to type the numbers into those boxes. Um, we see people confusing focused items with selected items. That was the first person. Um, and then we also, I've seen people trying to pinch zoom um, like the interstitial, or the, the native pop-up on tablets. And so they're looking at, a, if they've got poor eyesight, they're looking at on a tablet um, at a website, a very high pinch zoom, and then they they're like um, so open a select box and it brings up this thing and then it's no longer like readable for them. Uh, and pinch zoom doesn't work like that for those things. So. Um, and all of these users are fine with entering their date of birth um, just with a text input. Um, and I think maybe the reason that um, select boxes are like a common pattern is to get around a sort of validation and the fact that you can enter an ambiguous date in text. Um, but, you know, at GDS we have some design principles and one of them is do the hard work to make it simple. Um, this is our, what we ended up using for carer's allowance. Um, and register to vote and a bunch of other services. Um, and, and this tests fine. People are, people are totally okay with using that. Um, and the hard work part for this is like, you know, you have to do a bit of validation um, because we've sort of sorted the ambiguous date problem because we've separated the two day and month out um, and that works fine. Um, so don't use select boxes for a date of birth. Um, but maybe don't use them for other stuff as well. Um, so we aren't the only people that think that select boxes aren't very good. Um, Jacob Nielsen, 15 years ago, wrote drop-down menus used sparingly. So that was a long time ago. You'll recall Ricky Martin was number one back then. Um, yeah, tied it all up together. Nice, right? Nice. Um, and yet, like, here we are. Like, there's no, you know, we're still putting drop-down menus in things. Um, more recently, uh, Luke Grabluski has this thing, drop-down menus should be the UI of last resort. Um, I really like this last resort bit because um, there are times when the easiest or the safest option is to use a select menu rather than build something and then not support it properly, so it's just more broken than a select. Um, so, you know, you, when you're making those choices, you do have to weigh that sort of stuff up. Maybe your last resort, you, you reach for your select menu. Um, but there are good alternatives to drop-down menus and select inputs. Um, this is very straightforward. I hate this title. So, title drop-down menus, so annoying. Um, so, you know, you see this all the time tit for title. Um, and it really bugs me because um, the reason you ask someone for a title is so that you can address them formally and politely. So. Um, if I want to tell someone that I'm, my title is High Priestess of um, Select Box Haters, then that's, you should be okay with addressing me like that and not, um, and not restricting me to these like, human constructs of titles, right? Any title is a valid title if I tell you it is. It's not like, you know, like, it doesn't make any sense. It's like saying, um, tell us your first name, select it from this drop down menu of first names. <laughs> Um, so, you know, don't do that, but also if you have, like, there are many cases where you can eliminate a select box by just using uh, a text input, um, and that's fine. Uh, this kind of thing as well, like, just, you know, radio buttons are fine, you can use them instead of 
making people choose from that. I don't know what the benefit of doing that was. I mean, there's a vertical space issue with the design, which you might not be able to work around, but generally speaking, especially for short, small numbers of discrete data, like just use a radio button. Um, there are times when neither of these UIs will work for you. Like that was the only two good alternatives I could find, think of that didn't have other sort of issues like, like there's sliders and things, but people with motor problems find them difficult to use. And so, um, but so anyway, there are times when those th those two aren't going to be enough, um, and they kind. It's hard to think of a pathological case for them, but generally, it's like when you have too many options to list consecutively. And your users would know the thing they want if they saw it, but they so they basically need to browse a list of options and then choose from one of them rather than being able to type it. Um, although type aheads would be would be good if, if they could sort of start typing it even. Um, and those are the times when you would build a custom alternative. Uh, we have some on GovUK, so here's a very long select box that isn't very good. Uh, this is legal terms that lawyers who work in um, markets regulation would understand. Um, some bit really boring stuff on GovUK. Um, and so, you know, we can make it better by, by doing this. So this is just a scrolling list of checkboxes that is um, collapsible. So here it is on our site. If you go to gov.uk forward slash CMA hyphen cases, then you can see it there. Um, and it's, you know, it's really, it's very straightforward. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we built that, but um, first I want to cover how to make components good really shortly, really quickly. Um, firstly, you're going to want to make it accessible. Um, Steve Faulkner from the Pacciello Group has a very good seven-point checklist of how to make uh, like baseline accessible um, web components. Um, and so you should check that out if you're going to do this. Um, there's also the gold standard for web components, which is a standard to, for all web components, but it has a very good section on accessibility as well. So if you're thinking of doing this and you're worried that you haven't made something accessible, um, like the worst thing you can do is not check, and, uh, but you can go and like, there's just a list of stuff and you can be like, yep, 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 yep. And then you can rest easy. Um, so there are some more requirements for gov.uk, which you know you may not feel are important for your site, but um, but for gov.uk they are. So functional without JavaScript. That's just our baseline from which we progressively enhance everything, and it's m predominantly like the most sensible reason for that is that um, you know we're a, a website that serves documents, um, so we don't you know it's really the idea that we would need JavaScript to do that is just really silly, um, and then it needs to work in IE8 and above. Um, so progressive enhancement is as much about resilience as it is about inclusiveness. That's Brad is our um, technical architect, and he said that. Um, and it's because, you know, you're on a train and the JavaScript doesn't download, that kind of thing. You just want it. It should just work as, in as many scenarios as possible. Um, the reason we still support IE8 is because we still have a lot of IE8 users, and also they are in government, and so they're more vocal about needing to use gov.uk, then, you know, they have, they sort of, they need to use it to do their job, and so we need to support it. Um, the other thing that I really strongly feel about legacy browsers and people using them is that they're not doing it because their snotty child hasn't installed Firefox on their computer yet. Like, they're doing it because they're stuck there, because they don't have administrative rights on the computer they're using, or... They, you know, they're stuck in a department or something, you know. Like, there are people who go in, who interact with government services who don't own a computer. They access it via a library, which in the UK, have, there aren't any books in libraries anymore. It's mostly just computers. But people go in and use them to do their government admin stuff. And, like, they can't upgrade the browser in there. Like, they don't have admin rights on their computer. And so, you know, we really need to support those users. Um, the other thing is that we have a lot of users in government who are still using IE8 and... Like, my colleague went to a department, and um, he noticed they were using Firefox. And he was like, how did you guys get Firefox? That's really, that's really interesting. And um, the, uh, the person was like, oh, well, no, we don't actually have Firefox. What we have to do is download it every morning, um, <laughs> use it for the day. And then, because our computers are so se secure, um, all of the software we've installed during the day gets wiped every night. So we do that every day. <laughs> And like, I think about those users, and I'm like, you know what? Maybe we could just make our site work for you uh, in the thing that you're stuck with. So, you know, um, I mean, the, the the short bit about this is that we support users. 
uh, people, not browsers. This is Ed. This is my colleague who said that. Um, and so if some, even, if, even though we don't test in IE6 anymore, if someone has a, um, a problem, a bug in IE6, then we'll fix that for them um, because it's about people. It's not about technology for us. Um, and again, this is about doing the hard work to make it simple. And, and that is a lot of effort to do just to avoid using a select box. But, you know, that's kind of, that's like the challenge and the fun for me in doing front-end development is, is, is making those decisions and finding those ways around and, and doing that kind of stuff. Um, so building a custom widget is a lot more work than you think it's going to be, particularly when you consider um, supporting forwards into the whole of time. Um, and making it work with new technologies that are going to appear, um, making it accessible, making it backwards compatible. Um, and so maybe you think you want to build a custom widget for something, could be a select box, could be anything else, um, and then you're just like, you know what, this thing is nearly good enough, so we're just going to use that and it's safer. Um, but on the other hand, maybe you want to build something like this. Uh, this so this is our custom component. Um, it's a scrollable list of things. Uh, it tests pretty well, um, and it's progressively enhanced, so it doesn't, it's quite robust. Um, so with no JavaScript, it looks like this. Uh, there's, it's just a scrollable list of checkboxes. Um, the JavaScript comes in and um, makes the top bit there a button, and then, so it's just collapsible. Uh, it looks like this in IE6. Just doesn't, it just doesn't open and close because the performance is too janky. Um, the animation is just looks horrid. Um, so it's just IE6 users just end up with a lot of, it, lot of options down the side, and they're kind of fine. Like, if you imagine if you're still using IE6, everything would be rubbish anyway. You'd be like... Um, and it looks like this on mobile, so it just doesn't scroll. Um, I mean, these, like, this bit doesn't scroll. The whole page scrolls at the same time, because mobile users are more comfortable with, like, just lots of scrolling. Um, and then under the hood, it's just some HTML uh, that then gets kind of marked up with JavaScript, so... Um, and screen readers then therefore announce it as like a list of checkboxes, which is great. Um, and if it's shut, then it's just a button, uh, which is great. And, and because it's a button, it means that um, screen reader users and users of keyboards can um, like interact with it in the way they expect to be able to, which is cool. Um, so, I mean, originally we didn't have, um, we didn't hide the checkboxes um, from screen reader users. So they would just be read out as a long list. But then I was speaking to um, one of our accessibility consultants, Leonie Watson, and she was like, yeah, you know, screen reader users can benefit from hiding stuff in the DOM as well, as long as you let them know that you've done it. And I was like, God, Leonie, that's why we pay you the big money, of course. So, um, so I did that, and I made it a button, and, and I think it's a lot better now. Um, so yeah, button, div, uh, ARIA expanded true, ARIA expanded false. Um, and then uh, array controls. I mean, it's really not a lot of work to make this work in for like old browsers, various assistive technologies. The hard, like, you just have to, you know, I just had to try. I didn't really know 100% how to do any of this before I did it, but yeah. Um, so if you want to see the code, it's all on, it's all on GitHub um, in our components library. And um, in summary, and I, if you've seen this talk before, the summary is, is this is a new summary. Um, so people think that this talk is about the HTML select element, which would seem sensible, because I just spent half an hour talking about the HTML select element. Um, but they're wrong. Uh, this talk is actually about making things usable for humans, and how, as experts at the web, we're really bad at it. Like, we don't, you know, our expertise just blinds us to making, and the thing we're setting out to do is make really good stuff for everyone to use, right? Uh, but we just can't do it. Um, and it's tricky because the reason we can build websites is because we know the web, but the reason we're bad at our jobs is also because we know the web. Um, and so we're making things that don't work for real people. Um, and those users, like that guy using carers allowance, they need us to be better, and our job is to be better than we're currently being. Um, so, third time, do the hard work to make it simple. Um, that's all. Uh, you can read more at uh, various uh, gov.uk URLs. Here are the links from some things that I've said. Um, thank you.